We'll start today with codes and sampling, and then we'll finish on different types, and different ways to do D to A and A to D conversion. So the binary codes, sampling, and sampling and quantization errors. Um, binary codes and sampling, I think that you've, you've seen this before and you're familiar with it, so we can go over it quite quickly, but it's important to make sure that we're all familiar with all of the basic terms. A digital binary signal has two levels, 0 and 1. A binary word is a group of bits. A byte is an 8-bit word. A kilobit and a kilobyte, difference between capital B and lowercase b. N bits has two to the n different words available and different typical word lengths of A to D converter typically range from 8 to 16 bits, depending on how much money you want to pay. And it has a, they have quantization errors of 2 to the minus n. So then the binary word, g, the most significant bit is a to the n, and the least significant bit is a to the minus n. So for n equal 4, 2 to the n is equal to 16. And then these are the codes that are represented in this 4-bit word. So the range of a measurement signal is between 0 and 10 volts. There are 10 bits available to represent the signal. What is the resolution of the conversion? The resolution is 2 to the minus 10, which becomes really equal to 0 0.001 or 0.1 percent of full scale range, which turns out to be 10 millivolts. So if you have a 10-bit converter, and you want to put an analog signal from 0 to 10 volts, then the smallest change in your sensor response that you can measure is 10 millivolts. A measurement signal has an inaccuracy of 0.01%. What is the required number of bits? The resolution is 2 to the minus n, which will equal 0.0. 0, 0, 1, which is 0.01 percent. Minus n is equal to log base 2 of 0 0.0001, which is equal to 3.29. So you should choose a 10-bit conversion. Uh, I'm sorry, you should choose a 14-bit conversion um, in order to be able to resolve um, the accuracy. Sampling. The function is we have a measured signal and we want to sample that measure signal. So the errors in the frequency domain are called aliasing or folding and the pre-sampling filter. Errors in the time domain come from switching. So if we want to sample a signal in a time domain then we basically have to either provide a switch or provide some way to represent the signal with enough points so that we're sure that we can reproduce the signal with enough accuracy. So when we go to plot the function again, we get a true representation of what the signal looks like based only on our sampled points. Sampling rate should be matched to the signal changes. So if we sample, let's say, at a fewer number of points, well, then our signal could actually look something like this. Okay. Let's look at these aliasing errors in the spectrum. Consider the input signal V of t, which is rep represented by the red line in the upper plot. And we Fourier transform that into the frequency domain V of f, which is represented in the blue box on the lower plot. Now, the sampling function, the pure sample, in the time domain will be a series of switch events that have a period of t and in the frequency domain they'll have a frequency space of 1 over t 
and this is going to be the Fourier transform of the switching function of the sampling function. Now in the time domain we have V of T is multiplied by S of T so essentially the sampling switch is going to return a voltage of your input okay and so hopefully you're sampling at a high enough rate that you can represent your signal so this is an impulse reconstruction and what does the frequency spectrum look like well the convolution of V of F and S of F is the equivalent right of the multiplication in time so the convolution in frequency is similar to multiplication in the time domain so we take our Fourier transformed signal and we convolute that with the Fourier transform of the switching function and in the frequency domain the sampled signal spectrum is going to look like this we have the multiplication by an impulse train in time is equivalent to the convolution by an impulse train in frequency and the aliasing error is that it generates multiple copies of the original frequency content at frequency intervals of 1 over t. This is called the aliasing error. Because this happens in the frequency domain, we have this restriction that our sampling frequency has to be twice the maximum frequency of our signal. Okay, if we don't, then we get overlap that you see on the bottom plot, and that's going to introduce errors. This is our aliasing error. So our sample definitions, so our signal, V of omega, can be reconstructed completely if the angular sampling frequency satisfies omega s is equal to, or greater than or equal to, twice the signal frequency. This is called the Nyquist-Shannon criteria. During reconstruction of the time domain signal, two phenomena occur. The frequency content for V of t for omega greater than omega s divided by t is lost. Right? So all of those higher order, they're going to be lost when we bring it back to the time domain. Higher frequency from first aliases appear in reconstructed signals as low frequencies. And these are affected between omega, the absolute value of omega is equal to omega s minus omega zero, and omega, the absolute value of omega is equal to omega s, which is our sampling frequency, divided by two. Now the reduction of aliasing errors, we can use a pre-sampling filter as we show in this. And the pre-sampling filter is in red. Or what we can do is we can do oversampling, which consists of an analog low-pass filter, it's kind of relaxed, a sampler, a digital low-pass filter, and then a downsampler. So let's look at different types of samplers. Um, in this case, we can look at a sample and hold unit where we have an input VI and an output in a control block. And a one is to track and a zero is to hold. And this can be represented, let's say, by a switch and a capacitor and a buffer. So sample and hold is that we each one of these samples we hold it for a certain period of time and then we release it sample hold sample hold sample hold and depending on the rate when these things return to zero is actually quite important
because we can lose uh, a great amount of signal information if we're not careful in the sampling intervals. Now a track and hold system is interesting because we have our sampling at each one of these locations for a track operation and then a hold operation. So we track, sample, hold that, and then go into the track mode, which is the black mode track, then hold for a certain period of time, and then go into track mode, and then we track it again, sample and hold. And this provides less transience in our signals and can give us a better representation of the signal in the samples, from the samples. So in the measurement chain, we have an analog in signal, an anti-aliasing filter, a sample and hold circuit, a multi-level quantizer, binary coding, digital processor, a D to A converter, and then a reconstruction filter, and then we get our analog signal out. Um, this is a full analog in, analog out. Obviously, if we have analog in, if we're going to create a digital signal, then we're going to process that digital signal and then send it back out to the real world. If we have a digital signal and we want to put it back out into the analog world, then we have to reconvert. Um, so, different types of multiplexed measurements systems. Analog, we can have um, a multiplexer where we can have multiple sensors and we can have one sample and hold system, one A to D and then one to DSP. A digital type is where we have multiple sensors with individual sample and hold and individual A to D converters. We multiplex those, each one of those to a DSP. Okay, so now we'll move on to digital, to analog and analog to digital converters. Uh, we'll talk about analog to digital conversion, sampling, quantization, and coding, and errors, integral nonlinearity, differential nonlinearity, glitches, sampling, and quantization. So an analog to digital converter consists of an analog input voltage and an output digital code and the VIN is equal to G times VREF and G moves between 0 and 1 and G consists of most significant bit and least significant bit as we discussed earlier. Now for a digital to analog we have a digital code, the same format and the output then ranges between 0 and a reference voltage. Features of DACs and ADCs, number of bits, reference voltage, least significant bit, which is 2n to the minus n multiplied by VREF, and most significant bit, which is half the converter range. So two types of output, unipolar versus bipolar. So the bipolar range is located on the left. So for an analog input, you're going to range between 0, 0 and FF, let's say, for example. And in the center, you have ADH, and those are hexadecimal numbers. And for a unipolar, the input goes, transitions from 0 to some maximum value input. And likewise, your digital code moves from 0, 0 to FF hexadecimal, for example. So the analog input in the bipolar can go from a minus value to a plus value. 
but the overall range is the same. It's just that you can move between the unipolar and bipolar. Straight unipolar coding, you can see that we move between zero in the full scale. You can work out the numbers on your own. This is very, very straightforward. Binary offset bipolar coding. So the minus full scale and plus full scale are separated between 0, 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1 for this 4-bit code. So an example of this, an 8-bit A to D converter has an input range of minus 5 to 5. Determine the output code and straight binary code for an input voltage of 3 bit, 3 volts. And then which one of these is it? A, B, C, or D? For a straight binary code, so our least significant bit is going to be 10 volts divided by 2 to the 8, which comes out to be 39.1 millivolts, and our full-scale range is 10 volts. So the table on the right-hand side shows some codes for some of the digital codes that are represented. So in order for us to get closest to 3 volt, we have to start counting the bits. And if we start counting, then we see that the code 0100, gives us a value of 2.969, which is the closest to 3 volts. So that's the code that we want uh, to be able to represent 3 volts. And for a bipolar binary code, you can try this on your own. So you can try to find the code that will give you 3 volts by choosing the best binary representation using this bipolar code. Do this on your own. Perhaps it will be a homework problem. So bit representations, parallel serial. In parallel, this would be more of a dynamic range where they all occur at the same time. And in serial, then these things are going to be occurring in time. So for example, 1 occurs first, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. So these are all sampled sequentially um, in time. Whereas in the parallel case, at time t equal t, you have all of the bits 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. And then we have a static case where we will have switch will stick to a particular switch position and they won't move. <clears throat> and there are different ways to position these switches if you're doing a current type of switch. Um, and you can go over these. These are quite obvious. Features of DAX and ADC. Um, we have different types of characteristics of these systems that we need to go over. Uh, integral nonlinearity, this is the maximal deviation of the analog value of the measured characteristic from a straight line. Differential nonlinearity, maximum deviation in a one LSB analog step from the nominal step, V ref times two to the minus n. Monotonicity, output increases the same as the input increases. Glitch errors, unequal switching times introduced incorrect codes during a transition settling time, conversion time, and conversion rate. So the ADC transfer characteristic ideal, you have an analog input on the x-axis and then the digital code on the y-axis, and if we have a perfect ideal conversion, we're going to, you see we're going to have this perfect linear representation of the conversion into each one of these bits. In integral nonlinearity, as you see that some of the switch events are going to lead to a nonlinearity in the analog input, which is represented with this red line, which is different than the ideal straight dotted line that you see in the center. And that deviation at a particular bit location is called the integral nonlinearity. Now we also have something called an ADC differential nonlinearity where we have 
uh, differences in the switch events that lead to this differential nonlinearity. Um, these are caused by non-ideal switches. So the real one is in red and ideal is in blue. So depending on the precision of the system that you need, you have to get uh, an analog to digital converter um, that um, is typically far more expensive because it has very uh, precision electronics, analog electronics to be able to uh, provide very precise switching events. The analog to digital converter monotonicity, analog input on the x-axis, digital output on the y-axis, the ideal curve represented by the straight line that has a, a slope to it. Now you will see that the ideal converted signal is represented by the dotted line, but if we miss a particular code then the, the, the real signal that we get is basically going to miss this particular code conversion. So sometimes we can skip and we can miss codes. These are errors in our output representation um, and then our output is going to be significantly different and this leads to errors. So the ADC settling time, um, how quickly the switch can transition and reach um, the bit location. So it it is allowed plus, uh, plus or minus one half LSB for the system. So the, the switches have to be very precise to be able to go from zero to one and not to oscillate uh, too much um, so that it can actually transition to another state uh, or be interpreted as um, a zero instead of a one. So the ADC quantization noise is basically has to do with the uh, quantization into um, a different bit representation. Um, now the ideal converter performs a perfect rounding off to the nearest quantization level and the maximum error is one half LSB or minus one half LSB. Uh, for a fixed input signal and range the quantization error decreases with an increasing number of bits. In the case of a random input signal VI of t, the error ET has a uniform probability in the interval minus q over 2 to plus q over 2. So let's look at that. So for our quantization noise, we have a range 0 to VREF the number of bits n, number of levels 2 to the n, step size q is equal to vref multiplied by 2 to the minus n, and our error is minus 1 half q and plus 1 half. Now, if we assume this quantization error to have a uniform distribution between minus q over 2 and plus q over 2, then the quantization noise power is simply the integral from minus q over 2 to q over 2 of e squared times the probability density times e de the error and this comes out to be 1 over 12 q squared and the quantization noise voltage which is RMS then is 1 over square root of 12 multiplied by q and remember Q is our step size, which is VREF, 2 to the minus N. So the quantization error can be expressed as a signal-to-noise ratio. The number of distinct levels is 2 to the N over the range 0 to REF, or equivalently minus VREF over 2 plus VREF divided by 2. The quantization step Q is equal to VREF over 2 to the n minus 1, or approximately v ref multiplied by 2 to the n minus 1, 2 to the minus n. And the signal to noise is then approximately equal to 1.78 plus 6n dB. 
So the reference, the reference voltage determines the full scale range of the converter. And the resolution of an n bit converter has a resolution of VREF divided by 2 to the n minus 1, corresponding to one least significant bit. So we also have errors in the DAC systems. We have glitches. This is an example of an input signal VA in time. Um, a glitch essentially can be a half-scale glitch where we transition between 1000 and 1000000 and 0111 and 1111 and um, essentially the glitch this half-scale glitch is going to go between these two positions, um, and this is a this is this is a, a DAC glitch um, in the signal. Now there are different types of converters. Uh, we show DACs on the top and ADCs on the bottom. The code into the DAC and the analog output. This would be serial, and then we have a parallel code into the DAC and an analog output. And the serial converter for the ADC then has a serial code out, and then the parallel converter has a parallel digital code out. So we'll look at two types of DACs, a DAC with a serial ladder, which is parallel, and a serial DAC. So the DAC specs we can have unipolar, bipolar, um, inaccuracies, and conversion time. This is an example of a R2R ladder network. And then the current in the ladder network. You can work through these currents to see if they make sense. We'll probably have a homework problem on this. At each branch, half the current. And these are used in both DAX and ADC. Okay and the DAC with a ladder network and basically the output of the operational amplifier at the end is minus 1 IT times R which is equal to minus IR and then the digital numbers the sum of the digital numbers on the output AN 2 to the minus 1 work through this problem to make sure that you understand it We also have serial DACs where um, the system, the conversion principle is basically can, can be illustrated with the um, system located on the bottom where we have a reference signal and we have a switch that moves between 0 and 1 and we have our AI VREF and we have a summer, divide by 2 and then storage. So the least significant bit comes first in time. So if we operate this thing in step one, the step number in memory is one, one half A0 V ref, two is one quarter A0 V ref plus one half A1 V ref, all the way through in time. So this stru general structure does not depend on the number of bits. This is an example of analog devices. This is a multiplying DAC with a serial interface. You can read through some of these specifications. So analog to digital converters because of the time limitation there are many different types. We'll just talk about the successive approximation ADC which is serial and the integrating ADC dual slope. And the integrating dual slope is actually used in digital voltmeters so this is an important one to, to know. So if you want to choose an ADC, you want to select the most suitable ADC for the application that is based on um, more than precision or the number of bits. Different architectures are available, each with advantages and disadvantages. The required accuracy or precision of the system places choice of ADC based on the number of bits required. And the achievable accuracy of a converter will always be less than the total number of bits available. So in general, when you want to choose something, the number of bits, um, you can use this table for the resolution 
um, which is represented in percentage or parts per million or decibels. And then what kind of least significant bit can you resolve with 24 bits? You get down to 59.5 nanovolts. So if you want to choose it, architecture versus bits and bandwidth. Um, if you want to do a um, resolution versus uh, throughput, then if you have a low throughput, dual slope will give you the best resolution. If you have a high throughput and you want a high resolution, then you're going to have to use a flash type of system. Probably the most universal um, between resolution and high throughput is the Sigma Delta configuration that we won't talk about too much today, but it's quite a powerful technique. So successive approximation, register ADCs. Um, you can go through this general example that we show here today. It has an analog input with a comparator. It has a DAC located inside. It has a clock generator and a word generator. And you can see that it successively approximates your uh, analog input signal to get digital word. And this is an example um, that the uh, when you start and you stop, it tries to approximate based on successive guesses where the most significant bit and the least significant bit is. Um, and I uh, want you to go through this example to make sure that you understand how we come up with this code 101110 based on this example. So the specifications of the ADC typically something like 10 bit analog input minus 5 to plus 5 unipolar 0 to 10. This kind of offset uh, conversion time uh, on the order of tens of microseconds. So this is an example of an A to D converter. Um, this is a complete 8-bit A to D converter successive approximation uh, by analog devices. You can read through some of the details of this if you're interested to get more familiarity with it. So the other type of converter we have is a direct parallel A to C converter. Uh, it's a, called a flash converter, n bits, 2 to the n resistors and 2 to the n minus 1 comparators. It's a two-stage. It's very fast, um, but it's quite expensive because you need 2 to the n minus 1 comparators, depending on the number of bits that you want. So a 1-bit A to C for this system is basically this comparator, and it generates your logic word, your differential analog input. This is an example of uh, a system made by Maxim. Uh, you can read through some of the details on this. This has a, an on-chip 2.2 gigahertz track and hold amplifier uh, for the sampling as well. Uh, it's quite impressive. And you'll see at the center of this track and hold amplifier is this flash ADC. Okay, so the um, the next ADC that we'll talk about is this dual slope type of an approach where we have a reference voltage and our input voltage. We have an integrator, a comparator, and then a counter. Okay, at time d, t equals zero, our counter is zero. We integrate V in until the counter is at time t equal t1. And then we integrate minus V ref until V c is equal to zero, and that's time equal t2. So in the integrating ADC, in the first step, we integrate the input signal, which is shown in the red, which is typically a noisy signal, and we integrate it over a fixed time period from the start to T1. And we'll assume that the start time is T equal to 0. And then we reset the system, and then we integrate from minus V ref to 0 for the time that it takes that the, 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 the VC then becomes zero, and that becomes time t equal to two. Then we have the general relationship that t1 times v1 is equal to t2 minus t1 is equal to v ref. Therefore, the input voltage 
is equal to t2 minus t1 divided by t1 times v ref. Now this general approach, um, the noise averages out frequency by a factor of n over t1. This is an example of a dual slope A to C in the phases. We have in phase one auto zero, phase two signal integrate, and then phase two the reference integrate. Then in the end, our V in, as we said earlier, is T2 minus T1 divided by T1 multiplied by V ref. And this is an example of a high-performance um, dual-slope system. Uh, you can read more about some of the details in this from this data sheet. And then more details. I will stop the lecture today here, and I won't go further than the dual slope integrating amplifiers. Um, I will not include any homework examples on the sigma delta A to D converter because we don't have enough time. But you can read about it. It's quite a powerful technique um, uh, that um, has been developed over the, the last 20 years to be able to uh, convert analog to digital signals. Um, this concludes the lecture for today. We had a lot of material today, um, and I will give you some homework problems um, to try to uh, uh, show you the most important points of the lecture today. Uh, most of the lecture today was review, but it was important to make sure that you see all of the information um, in one unified place. So I will meet you and talk to you um, in the next lecture, Lecture 6, on Monday, the 2nd of December. Thank you.